Good afternoon, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today. And uh, my name is Maciej Piechocki. I'm uh, from Bering Point. I'm a RecTech Management Board member. It's a uh, pleasure for me to moderate the first panel today on the implications of COVID-19 on the structure of the EU banking market. The objective of this panel is uh, to have a look into the crystal ball, in a sense, uh, but also discuss if there is some lighting uh, in the tunnel, light in the tunnel coming. And I have a great honor to have uh, the possibility to discuss these important topics with my esteemed panelists. Uh, we have uh, online here Lorenzo Binismagi, Chairman of the Board of Directors from Societe Generale, uh, Dr. Bettina Orlop, Chief Financial Officer from Commerzbank AG, and already uh, in the keynote, Felix Hufeld, President of the Federal Financial Supervisor Authority, the Buffin. So far, as already heard in the keynote, the European banks have weathered the storm. But will they be able to withstand a prolonged economic downturn? If the recovery is prolonged, the current forecast predicts uh, the problems in the real economy are likely to spill over into the banking sector. And the further developments in the midterm depend, of course, on the development of the pandemic, but also how the economy recovers. So let me start with a very short question to each of our panelists. Uh, lessons learned from your institutions, from your organizations, from the corona crisis. And dear Bettina, if we could start with your view, please. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, the, the um, pandemic um, clearly has evolved into um, a real um, global economic crisis, um, we have to say, and it's, it's really covering um, or touching all, um, all types of the society, all um, areas. And um, so far, I would say financial institutions have mastered this challenge pretty well. Um, also, um, clearly with the support of um, the um, governmental and the supervisory authorities. And um, if you look at um, um, Germany, um, German economy has, has um, seen a sharp decline in Q2, but has nicely um, um, developed um, in, the, in the third quarter. And um, if you now look at the current consensus also among economists, etc., they are rather optimistic. Um, but um, we are not out of the woods. Um, crisis is still ongoing. And I think we closely um, have to monitor the next, I would say, 12 months to see what's, what's, what's really um, to expect. If I now do an interim, because we are still in the crisis, so it's preliminary lessons learned, I would say, I would list three. Um, one is never underestimate the strength of your organization in a crisis. Second is, and um, we heard that already from Felix Hufeld, um, the intermediary role of banks um, is, is really vital and important. And third, rules and regulations introduced after the financial crisis have proven to be pretty important in this crisis. If I start with the first one, um, if someone would have told my board colleagues and me back in February that we would now put 80 to 90% of our staff in home office, including IT operations, trading um, and sales, and would just have the business model intact, we would have said, no way that we do that. Um, test turned into reality, and um, it, it, we showed it basically that we were able to deliver um, to our clients and even to a larger extent than we would do in normal times. So processes were stable, systems were stable, um, and I think that is also important to keep in mind for the upcoming months. Second, um, the intermediary role of, of banks is really important and, and vital. Why do I say that? There was fast action necessary in March and April to really cover the liquidity and financial needs um, of our corporates and households. And I think we mastered this challenge together with the development um, institutions very well. And what was the key insight out of that, and what is the key takeaway, what was really important in that, specifically between banks and corporates, was the lending relationship, the existing lending relationship. And that is also something which we should keep in mind for the future, because the better the relationship was, 
so more trust, more details that we had, it really helped clients, or we could help our clients much faster and better um, to, to, to master the challenges they have been in in the past months. And um, that um, in, in combination with, I would say, a well-diversified um, credit portfolio and deep sector expertise helped. Um, we haven't seen a lot of defaults because of Corona so far. So this is why we still book a lot of top level adjustments to just make sure that we have enough provisions. Um, and I would say that specifically the first quarters in 2021 will be the defining moments where we see where we end up. Third lessons learned, rules and regulations. I have to say a lot have been a burden which have been introduced um, after a financial crisis for the banks. But now with the liquidity and the capital buffers which we built up since the financial crisis, it gave us a lot of stability and security specifically in March and April that we had these buffers. And, um, and then in combination with the temporary reliefs which were provided by the supervisory authorities, that in combination really stabilized the situation. And I think now we need to be very careful when phasing out these relief measures. And I think whenever the crisis is over, we also need to sit down to reflect what has been good, which regulations went well, which ones do we need to adjust? Because there were also some who rather acted, I would say, pro-cyclical, which were clearly not intended and which we need to change. That's for now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Lorenzo, what about lessons learned from your perspective? Well, thank you first. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm sorry I could not be with you. I would have liked very much, but unfortunately mobility is not as it was. I mean, to try to be, to be frank and look uh, in a crude way, I think there are good news or good lessons and bad lessons, or maybe lessons uh, that can be improved. If I look backwards, um, I, I can only share the view uh, of Felix uh, Hufeld. I mean, the banks uh, were prepared, were in a strong position to address this crisis. Uh, the capital position was strong. Uh, there were some uh, issues to be addressed, but certainly they were able to absorb the shock. And I think in the end, we have to congratulate the European Union and, uh, and the Eurozone in particular when it created, decided to create the banking union. Because of the, one of the most interesting issues from this crisis is that we did not have a, a banking crisis, but we did not have also a bank sovereign crisis. Some banks in the south did as well, if not better, than other banks in the north. So there were no differentiated treatment or a credibility issue on the supervisory uh, approach. So the uniformity that was provided by banking union was fundamental, I think. And so we avoided the mistakes of the previous crisis. Now, uh, this is only one part of the, of the equation. And this is the first part of the speech by Felix. Now, if I go to the second part, uh, bank stocks have gone down by 45% double the U.S. stocks. So we have to ask ourselves, you know, why is that and what does it say? And I think, as Felix said, the key issue is to know whether we will have enough capital going forward, we'll have enough buffers. And I think the approach that supervisors are taking is to have a fixed cake, like capital is a fixed amount. In fact, it is not. How do you generate capital today? Uh, especially if you need it. You generate it by being profitable. Second, you generate it by attracting capital to the industry. And I think here uh, supervisors have to reflect a little bit whether the measures they have uh, adopted are not making the banking industry non-investable, to use a harsh word. And... Uh, and whether in the end this is not counterproductive to uh, the role that banks should make or should have to support the economy. Let me be direct. 
if you take the banking industry, the banking sector, out of the rest of the economy, which is a market economy, and you consider it as a suddenly as a charitable business, whereby uh, people that have invested in it cannot take any profit, any small profit even, then uh, basically you will have no investor that is interested into it. And if you change the rules of the game, as the regulators have done, because there was a rule to distribute uh, dividend, now they have changed the rule. Now we learn today, at least in Germany, they have a new rule. Maybe in other countries they will have a new rule. And if these are new rule is the higher the capital, the more you will likely you will have the possibility to distribute the small dividends that you will have. Then the incentive for banks is to have more capital. That is to lend less. And is to support less the economy. This is procyclical. I think you have to reflect, uh, Felix, on this. Uh, 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 if, in the end, the message to the banks is the more capital, even the higher buffers than in the past, the more likely to distribute dividends, this will lead to a procyclical reaction. And... Um, this, incidentally, is not what is going to happen in the U.S., and the markets have understood this. This is why bank stocks have fallen so much in Europe, while uh, nearly twice as much as in the U.S. I think that we have to look at the issue of banks within the context of the economy as a sector where we will need maybe more capital, we will need no new investors, and in order to attract these investors, we have to explain that this is going to be a profitable business. And of course, uh, not immediately maybe, but in perspective. And of course, there are other issues. Maybe we will come back on that, on how to improve the functioning of the banking system in Europe, in particular to continue the reforms for the banking, to complete the banking union, which is still uh, incomplete, and to move to a capital market union, which is the big difference with the US uh, in terms of also supporting uh, the financing of the economy and making uh, the financial sector more profitable. I would stop here maybe for this first round. Thank you, Lorenzo. I think it's uh, also a good uh, move to discuss the crystal ball in midterm. So maybe, Felix, uh, how do you see the, the midterm uh, view on the banks? You already alluded to a number of things uh, in the keynote. Happy that you react on Lorenzo's point, but uh, how would supervisors need to adapt in the midterm? Well, we have to adapt like everybody else, that's for sure. And I think some of the issues Lorenzo addressed um, will have to be addressed in the midterm as well, possibly short to midterm even. And so, so reacting to some of the comments Lorenzo made are part of the answer to your question. Um, are there components in current regulation which, um, which may prove to be excessively procyclical, I think, yes, there are components in regulation which have to be reviewed in that regard. And by regulation, I'm, I, 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 I'm not just referring to traditional financial regulation. It, it potentially includes IFRS, meaning accounting rules as well. But that's a very tricky thing because I'm a big believer in risk-sensitive and risk-orientated financial regulation, which by definition um, has a strong component of cyclicity in it. So it's a very thin line to calibrate that well. A second component which I've heard in both um, Bettina Orlop's statements as well as Lorenzo's, at least between the lines, is um, another difficult calibration between, let me say, structural capital buffers and capital requirements versus more cyclical components. Um, Philosophically, I take your point. Philosophically, I do believe that we should spend more time, and we will most certainly in the not so distant future, to possibly strengthen um, uh, capital requirements in a more cyclical fashion. Um, however, to be very honest, as much as I like the idea conceptually, I'm a little bit scared whether we, all of us, the, the political, regulatory, and, and of course, corporate community will get it right. 
Because if you open that can of worms, um, let's just say you swap 100, 200, or more basis points from structural capital requirements into more cyclical, flexible components. You can do that. There are countries who are considering that as we speak. Um, you have to get it right in, in terms of timing. And then it's people like yourself, Lorenzo, who shouldn't complain in good times when we are cracking down on your balance sheets and saying, hey, you have to increase 200 basis points of your, of your capital because it's good times. So we do have, in its totality, the right buffers if we move into bad times. Because if there's one thing, and you confirm that, and I couldn't agree more with that, um, which we have to look out for, is um, you can't plan surgically for each and every crisis. You have to provide for a basic level of resiliency by means of capital liquidity and all sorts of things without exactly knowing where the next crisis will hit you. You don't know. So there has to be a basic level, a more ro a quite robust level. And if we enter the sort of the cyclical, cyclical game in a, a much more subtle manner than we have done it so far, we have to trust ourselves, and that includes people like myself, that we get this game right. And that, that, that's not a small question. Uh, now, your question, of course, goes broader than that. Um, I think the big C's um, which will dominate bank management in the next couple of months and years. Um, the first C is the resurgence of good old-fashioned credit risk management. Credit risk is front and center of what will keep us busy in the next, and keep the industry busy for the next couple of years. The second is cost management. It, it, we, it, it, it is quite obvious that, that we, we are not done with it. And the third is consolidation. Um, so this more structural component. Um, Europe altogether is certainly a more, and, and, and Germany in particular, a, a, a highly fragmented banking market. Um, some countries much less, Germany and a couple of other countries much more, and that has to continue and it will continue, and I think we will see more of that. Now, I find it interesting, both of you made reference uh, uh, directly or indirectly to um, the capital market. I would full heartedly agree with something Bettina said a moment ago. I, find it, I would find it a pity, and I say that very clearly because I heard statements like that in the past, to turn one of the most important political projects I think being around, meaning the Capital Markets Union project, into an anti-banking union project. I've heard in the past, not recently, but three, four years ago, lots of argumentation, we need a capital markets union to reduce dependency on bank financing. I think that's a pretty rough cut statement because we just saw how important dependency on bank financing is. We need a capital market union for the sake of having capital markets, for the sake of having homegrown, stronger European capital markets. I'm, I couldn't push more forcefully for completing and driving forward a capital market. It's, however, unlike banking union, it's a much more diverse and in itself a much more difficult animal to manage, both politically as well as technically. But I would give my left arm to make capital markets union a big success over the next three to five years. Um, I think that is a very, very, very important um, project. And uh, you alluded to the tasks or challenges for management of the bank. So, Bettina, if you look at Commerzbank, uh, mergers, digitalization, uh, more efficient design of the value chains, there's a number of topics. How is your view on the mid-term perspective? Well, first of all, profitability is key. I think um, that is no question. That has been, by the way, true also before the crisis because we have investors who expect from us that we earn our um, cost of equity. Um, but it's even more true during the crisis because we have seen that you need to have a cushion, a buffer in your profitability to absorb um, higher LLPs as we currently see and not get into troubles. Um, and um, we definitely need to take into account the market environment. Um, and there, I think the key word is um, 
lower for longer, or you could also say negative for longer. I think we have to work with that. Um, we can't um, assume anything else. Um, and specifically for Germany, we also have to accept the fact that the margin situation in Germany is less favorable than in other countries, and we just have to manage these conditions as conditions um, and work with it. Um, Profitability, um, um, Felix already said it. Um, I mean, there are um, um, key levers how you how you um, um, influence your profitability. Um, one is clearly revenues. Um, um, second is improve your um, RWA efficiency, which has a lot to do with how do you use your capital and for what. And third, um, reduce your costs. Um, and digitization, and you also mentioned that digitization is the key driver for that. Um, because it's, it clearly helps us on the revenue side to provide banking faster, more efficient, more convenient to our clients, retail and corporates. And by the way, Corona definitely helped in that because we see a clear trend also here in Germany of specifically also retail clients towards digital channels. Secondly, it's also helping us to develop um, via AA and other things more tailored um, um, product and service offerings to our clients. So that's the revenue side. On the cost side, it's also pretty clear when you have the possibility to serve your clients via more efficient digital channels, that definitely helps your cost base. And if you are able to digitize end-to-end -end your processes, you increase your productivity and therefore you reduce costs, i.e. in operations. But I have to say digitization also helped us in the crisis because we were able to fastly, quickly develop certain applications which we used in the corona crisis. A corona heat map to really have early warning indicators on a day-by-day -day basis for us, for our regulator, um, for our supervisory board. Also online application tools for the government support which we really developed in days to really make access or provide access to the, to the support measures as quick as possible. And the other part is clearly consolidation. That is, that is um, a driver how you can achieve um, higher um, profitability. The question is how and when. Um, I think um, midterm, it is something which we need to achieve within Europe. And I mean, short term, there is a hot debate um, given recent events in, in Italy and Spain, but I think it's more a midterm topic because as Lorenzo already said, we also need to have a more developed banking union, capital market union, otherwise we are not able to really generate um, profits out of cross-border consolidation. Domestic consolidation is different. That I would just say, looking on Germany, I think all players need first to do their homework and then um, we can look after that one. But I think it's key because otherwise we will not compete or we will not be able to compete against the American and international players. Thank you, Bettina. Lorenzo, how does it resonate with you and what your crystal ball says for the midterm? Well, I, I would like to express my wishes uh, following uh, what Felix said about banking union and, and capital market union. Certainly banks are very much in favor of capital market union because a strong capital market makes it easier for bank to lend, uh, to lend, uh, to securitize, uh, to resell on the market um, and, and, uh, and to make fees, a better balance between fees rather than interest margins. If you look at the structure of US banks and European banks, um, uh, hey, clearly the percentage of fees in the U.S. banks is stronger than, than, in, than, in, than, in, than in Europe. And if you look at the biggest European bank and the biggest uh, U.S. bank, it's interesting because the size of the balance sheet is the same. But the capitalization is 10 times higher in the U.S. And why is that? Well, partly because U.S. banks are able to, uh, 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 to use a capital market uh, in a very efficient way. And this we don't have. Now, I'd like to push a little bit, uh, Felix. Uh, how do we achieve a capital market union? Uh, well, <laughs> first we have to, to achieve a banking union. And to achieve a banking union, we have to remove some uh, national discretions, national regulations, um, uh, uh, make capital and liquidity freely flow throughout the union. I mean, 
That's key. Second, uh, how do we move from a fully fledged banking union to a, a true capital market union? Well, we need to, to make banks uh, and market makers stronger. Not only, we will not have a capital market union only with American banks. Uh, uh, we, we need European banks, strong European banks. So we need to make them able to, to compete. And finally, just to provoke uh, uh, Felix, we need a single supervisor. So um, uh, uh, we need to do the same things as we've done with monetary union and banking union. So I, I don't want you to lose one arm. I want you to have both and to embrace uh, fully the capital market union uh, uh, by becoming a member of a, a committee of capital markets, uh, supervisors, or whatever, uh, uh, and have a, a strong European uh, uh, capital market. Thank you, Lorenzo. And as we are running out of time, short question to uh, Bettina and Felix. And a final piece of advice for our audience, the leaders of European banks for the management of their institutions in the midterm. Felix, let's start with you. Stay cool, stay cautious, and stay tuned. Thank you. Bettina, short piece of advice. I think, I mean, transformation is key. Transformation towards digitization, towards sustainability. And you, we all have to be aware that it will be never over. So it is a continuous process. It's not a program. It is a process which will never stop. Thank you very much. Lorenzo, any final piece of advice for the leaders of European I'm, banks? I'm very willing to stay tuned and to listen to what the regulators will tell us <laughs> over the next few months. Good Hopefully time. good news. <laughs> thank you very much. And with thank this, you. I would like to thank our panelists. Thank you very thank much you. for discussion.